Well, thank you for having me. My name is Emily Butler. Um, I'm going to give a lecture today called uh, Hannah Performances and Palindromes. So two things uh, first struck me when I encountered the work of Hannah Villiger. When I moved to Basel, I saw her work at the Gegenwart uh, as part of the Kunstmuseum Basel. And I was really struck uh, by this very large scale uh, four block uh, work, which is mounted onto an aluminium. And I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. It almost looked like a, a landscape. Uh, it looked quite painterly. Or, and I wasn't quite sure whether it was a close up of a texture. And it was a very uh, abstract work in a way, but also quite surreal. And uh, this compelling work actually dates from 1996. It was one of her later works and its title was Sculptural, which intrigued me. The second anecdote was when I uh, first started discussing this project with its curator, Yasmin Asha. She told me that uh, Hannah Villiger uh, considered her work sculpture. So these two first impressions really struck me. And this forms the, the ground of my research for my catalogue essay and for my presentation today. Um, I was uh, really interested in unpacking what Villiger meant by the term sculpture and sculptural through notions of performed action. Whilst the sculptural quality of her work has been written about previously, not much has been written in relation to performance and performativity. So in my research, I quickly came to a quote uh, where Hannah Villiger writes in 1985 that she worked in many media, including painting, sculpture, performance, and photography. And it struck me as her definition of performance, just like that of sculpture, and other media seemed to be very fluid. So in the same way that I was challenged when I saw her work at the Gegenwart, not to pin her, to, her work to a specific category, uh, Villiger powerfully dismantles the traditional divisions between artistic media. She prefigures the works of a younger generation of artists, uh, some of whom have been brilliantly selected by the show curators Madeleine Shupli and Yasmin Afsha to be included to accompany the show. Language is also an important component in the understanding of the terms sculptural and performative in relation to her work, which I will unpack further. What I aim to look at in this presentation is the wider question of performativity in relation to Villiger's work, the performativity of her actions, the performance of the viewer, and the performativity of language and gender as we read the work. I also wish to consider the international context in which Villiger was working after graduating from art school in the early 1970s. Hannah Villiger enjoyed making the familiar seem strange, all the way from her early work showing objects flying out of the frame to her overexposed later gigantic prints. Her images seem to be taken from too close. Sometimes they were shot from a bird's eye view, yet she also offered coordinates to the viewer through a set of frameworks and grids. And she was obsessed with the near square format of the Polaroid image, which she blew up to a large scale, setting them in different combinations and at different angles, sometimes 90 or 180 degrees. In her early works, which she produced at the Swiss School in Rome in around 1976, we witness a palm branch being hurled through the air above us or below us off, off the edge of a cliff outside of the frame. And the camera attempts to capture the branch's fleeting and vertiginous flight path. What's striking ever since these early pieces is the consistency of a performed action, whether the body is present or absent. The body that's out of the frame, hurling the branches in the early works, the photographer that has attempted to arrest the motion or time, and later on, the person who set up a situation or a pose in Villiger's studio. The body is most, mostly, or at least certainly later on, that of uh, Hannah Villiger herself. Yet our body is also implicated as we move around and as we fathom the subject matter as viewers, the angle of the photograph, the scale of the prints, and the three-dimensional installation. I want to unpack now what I mean by the terms sculptural and performative in relation to her work. To go back to this 1985 quote that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, where Hannah Villiger was writing about her artist book Envy, or Nade, uh, in the Kunsthalle Basel Verheyen's uh, yearbook, 
She says, my aim is not just to represent a given, but to create an autonomous work of art. To this end, I use the means of painting, sculpture, performance, and photography. So while she often produced photographic images, Hannah Videger worked across many media and wanted her works to be understood in three-dimensional terms. She titled them principally Sculptural from 1983, as she developed the signature in large snapshots of her body. Perhaps she'd read Rosalind Krauss's 1979 essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field, and she was, of course, also taught by Anton Egloff in the early 1970s, in its turn, a proponent of sculpture as a site and a context-related installation. So Villiger's exhibitions themselves were also called sculpture, considering the relationship between the elements in the work, the skin of the photographic surface, and the architecture of the space. Villiger took many Polaroid images, but the accredited works that she printed up in large format and installed in her exhibitions, as, the, as well as the works that she finished assembling as maquettes, ready to be printed. Their full quality as sculptural and as sculpture is established when they become public, i.e. when the public experiences the relation of the different elements in the frame the sculptural, and also uh, in the form of artworks as part of three-dimensional installation with the associated titling, Sculpture. Yet, if the presentation of Villiger's body, objects or landscapes for camera become sculptural, in the process they're also performative. Her actions can be described as performative, more specifically as they involve an artistic or acting performance for an intended public, i.e. the exhibition viewer. Villiger ritually performed in front of the camera. She captured um, her body's physicality, its sensations, its feelings, and the way it interacted with objects, mostly in her home studio, for example, with a plate, with colored fabrics, or using a mirror. But she also um, did this by looking away from herself outside of, out of the window over the rooftops of Paris. These images were all taken in the privacy of her studio, but they were performative actions caught on a Polaroid and selected to made into a, an artwork and thus public. The performative nature of her actions is re revealed through repetition by dissecting the poses and daily actions to expose their absurdity or to make them become extraordinary. For example, uh, she zooms in on the skin of her neck as it cranes with different emotions such as pleasure or pain, she looks at small gestures such as picking her nose, laughing, following her shadow, or flinging the window open. And I'm referring here to uh, individual frames within two works, which, which are called Arbeit uh, from 1980, 1981. These types of everyday gestures and poses are repeated to the point of sublimation. I'm going to look now, uh, I'm going to turn now to looking at the context in which Villiger was working and some possible sources of inspiration. So during her early travels uh, in Switzerland to Rome, Los Angeles and Canada in the, in the 1970s, Villiger encountered uh, different developments in conceptual and feminist art. As a young art student, she was impressed when meeting the artist duo Gilbert and George at their exhibition opening at the Kunstmuseum Luzern in 1972 when she was a student. She no doubt encountered their motto, Art for All, which meant, which they meant um, the art is part of life. At the Kunstmuseum, they performed uh, their singing sculpture performance, uh, where they're wearing their signature suits, they have their faces painted in bronze, and they're repeatedly singing a very popular British interwar song, which was called Underneath the Arches. This is a work that they uh, stated they, they started in 1969 after realizing uh, to make art, you don't need objects. You can just make yourself the object. Then you are more complex than a sculpture can ever be. So straddling art forms, including sculpture, performance, video, and photography, Gilbert and George did not want to be limited to the traditions of a medium. And they described their works nonetheless in simple terms such as painting, photo pieces, and later pictures. Their bold grid of images must have really impressed Villiger. But more importantly, their notion of being living sculptures that are continuously performing, questioning the borders of self, society, and environment. These are references that would no doubt have marked Villiger's work. 
Meanwhile, also in 1972, this time in the United States, Eleanor Anton started a crash diet, recording her nude body's gradual slimming every day on camera from four different angles. As if standing in a police lineup or for an ethnographic photo study, she painstakingly recorded her body's daily imperceptible changes as she attempted to carve it into the ideal proportions of a classical female figure, and in the process, also becoming sculpture. Here, Anton makes the performance of pain and gender disarmingly visible as she's posing in the nude, whilst at the same time highlighting society's tendency to objectify women since antiquity. Carving a traditional sculpture has since become a cornerstone of early feminist art. Arranged also in a grid, carving poked fun at the supposed objectivity of her, her male peers. Interestingly, the work had been rejected from the Whitney Biennial for being conceptual rather than sculptural, according to the jury. But Anton, like Gilbert and George, was also dismissive of categories, considering it equally sculpture, conceptual art, performance, and photography. So whilst Villiger was not performing a continuous artistic or sculptural identity like Gilbert and George, in her sculptural works and early works in Bildhauerei, whose etymology comes from picture hewing or carving, she explored the expanded notion of making art in three dimensions. She acknowledged that sculpturing, sculpting is a process that involves hers and other bodies within a framework, a subject which Anton is also teasing out in her series. Before consistently calling her work sculptural, Villiger briefly called them sculpting in 1982-1983 both terms underlying action and experience in the process of becoming sculpture. The subject of women using their bodies through performance and for the camera, i.e. body art, was explored during the 1970s by feminist writers Lea Vagine and Lucy Lippard. Lippard looked at how they used their own bodies as political tools by referring to work such as Anton's. Billiger would no doubt have been, had access to these writings of these uh, seminal feminist art historians as they were published in major art magazines such as Art in America. Billiger's work engages directly in this thorny question of representation. It unpicks to a certain extent how we perform an identity every day and how our actions and representations might be conditioned by society and its expectations around correct feminine behavior. This is most apparent uh, in works where Villiger captures, captures the small uh, liberating actions, such as going topless, smoking, or the bliss felt when her body interlocked with her lovers. I'm referring here to another work in the show called uh, Arbeit from 1981. And uh, these were works produced using hers and her lover, uh, Susan Visser's bodies. So drawing on this feminist influence, I wish to conclude in this final section by looking deeper into how Billiger explored fractured notions of self in her work. I want to mention now another quote, which is also drawn from her 1985 text on her book, Envy. The word need, envy, describes a dialogue that I conduct with myself. One that was envious and the other was envied. The title also signified my envy of the life of its own that the work took on. I chose this quote as it shows her dialectical thinking, or um, shall I say thinking in palindromes or through wordplay, and it reflects on split notions of subjectivity. To dig further into the influence of feminist writings on gender and identity in Villiger's work, I want to turn to a quote by Lucy Lippard, where she outlined how many works by women in the 1970s explored the performance of self in a drive towards self-exploration, self-criticism, and transformation. The subject is clearly probed in Villiger's artist book, Need, which explores self-representation through multiple super-individual images, i.e. repeated images of extreme close-ups of her body parts. This is also confirmed in the quote from the Kunstverein yearbook that I just mentioned, which talks about envious versus envied, which I just read out. There are no simple self-portraits in need. Villiger examines and transforms her body into a body. And also, there's no clear reading of this body. 
Instead, Villiger explores fractured notions of self. When looking at the later close-ups of body parts and or objects, we're left unsure of what the image is capturing, its scale, the borders between inside and out, and one body and, and another dissolve, and it becomes almost like an abstract landscape, just like the Gegenwart work that I first encountered. By using tools such as repetition and inversion of the image, Villiger avoids any objective conceptual gains. She complicates any single singular viewpoint. There's no clear sequence. In the process, her grids can be read from either side in the manner of a word square, square or a palindrome. So Villiger's exploration is also semiotic. We're asked to piece together all the individual signifiers in each frame. We're implicated to con continuously as viewers to establish the meaning of this autonomous work of art. Having lived in Paris intermittently in the late 70s and 80s, she no doubt would have encountered the deconstructive theories, uh, writings uh, by uh, Jacques Derrida, or drawing from the influence of Roland Barthes, who wrote extensively about photography. And all these writings looked at the dynamic relation between language, image, space, and self. Author Quinn Latimer remarks, we write ourselves with our bodies and our bodies are written for us. And she calls uh, Hannah Villiger's works autofictions in a text for the Institut Sitzero uh, in 2021. So if performativity involves an artistic gesture, one of its layers is the performance of language as we've just touched on. Drawing on the traditions of conceptual art and through her friendship with artist philosopher Rémi Zaug, as we've seen in her meticulous titling of the works and series, Villiger was acutely aware of the power of language and chose to use it sparingly. By calling the works sculpture and sculptural, it validates their intended function. The first term propels the work out into the three dimensions of the exhibition space, calling the viewer to engage with it as sculpture. The second draws uh, attention to Villiger's performative and sculptural actions. So just as Villiger um, unpicks the performativity of representation, so she questions the performance of language and the nonverbal. In this sense, she contests the notion of a fixed subject, which was later developed in Judith Butler's theories on performativity, uh, who's had a significant influence on the next generation of artists working since the 90s. Butler states, just as bodily surfaces are enacted as the natural, so these surfaces can become the site of a dissonant and denaturalized performance that reveals the performative status of the natural itself. So to conclude, by using repetition, fragmentation, challenging, challenging the boundaries of medium, especially that of photography, performance and sculpture, by making the image become strange, Villiger makes us look again at our preconceptions of our bodies, self, and its representation. She's always refusing stasis. Anna Villiger's ever dynamic work can be read in many directions, just like a palindrome. Thank you. <laughs>